Good Friday and welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Chuck Todd reporting in Washington at what is a pretty fraught moment for this country. Former President Trump, the current frontrunner for the Republican nomination, has been indicted by the Manhattan District Attorney. It's the first time ever in this country's history that it, criminal charges have been brought against a former U.S. president. We're going to dive into what this means politically in a moment, but first, here's what we know about the charges. The grand jury's indictment remains under seal. Sources tell NBC News that the former president is likely facing approximately 30 counts of document fraud-related charges tied to those hush money payments he made back in 2016. He signed 11 checks, maybe 11 times 3 gets you into the 30s, perhaps counts, things like that. You can see where we're going here. But we don't know what those charges are exactly, and we don't expect to see the charging documents until early next week. Uh, either right before or right after the arraignment. So keep that in mind when you hear the reaction coming from the former president, his allies, and his distractors. We don't quite know yet what's in this indictment. Right now, the former president's lawyers and two senior officials close to the investigation tell NBC News they do expect him to fly to New York on Monday night and at surrender to authorities on Tuesday morning when he'll appear in court at his arraignment and enter a plea. One of his lawyers appeared on the Today Show this morning and said the former president is not going to take a plea deal. And he's prepared to fight this case in court. He initially was was shocked. After he got over that, um, he, he you know he put a notch on his belt and he uh, you know he decided we have to fight now. And and he got into a you know a typical Donald Trump posture where he's ready to to be combative on on something that he believes is an injustice. Um, his knees don't buckle Savannah, so I, I think uh, he's now in the posture that he's he's ready to fight this. The announcement of the charges have been a rallying cry among some Republican lawmakers and even among Mr. Trump's 2024 rivals. Former U.N. Ambassador and presidential candidates Nikki Haley said the charges were more about revenge than about justice. Again, we don't know what the charges are. Trump's top 2024 rival, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, called them a weaponization of the legal system to advance the political agenda of a George Soros-funded prosecutor. Again, we don't know what's in the indictment. Uh, Trump's former Vice President Mike Pence, who recently said history would hold Trump accountable for his actions on January 6th, also came to his former running mate's defense on this topic. I think the unprecedented indictment of a former president of the United States on a campaign finance issue is an outrage. I think the American people are going to look at this, see it as one more example of the criminalization of politics in this country. The message that this sends to the wider world is a terrible message about the American justice system. And I, I would that this Manhattan DA would have thought better of it. And, and put the interests of the nation first. NBC News has learned that Mr. Trump has been calling Republicans in Capitol Hill to further attempt to rally their support. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy accused Bragg of election interference while also vowing to use his powers in Congress to help Mr. Trump by going after the DA. There's also talk among some of the former president's most ardent supporters, including Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, of organizing protests in New York City next week to coincide with the arraignment. In a message this afternoon, the Senate Sergeant at Arms and Capitol Police said they do anticipate demonstration activity nationwide, but they did add that they had not received any specific credible threats. Meanwhile, Mr. Trump has been posting on social media, attacking Bragg and the judge that's been assigned to his case. Now you think, why is he already attacking the judge? What does he know? Well, this is the same judge that oversaw the Alan Weisselberg case, for what it's worth. Uh, he's also fundraising off of this and lamenting what he says is America's decline to a third world nation. We should point out that while Trump is the first former U.S. president to face criminal charges, he's far from the first former leader of a liberal democracy, small l liberal here, for those of you not sure of how I'm using this word, to find themselves in court which is what you might expect in societies that do uphold the rule of law. For example, former Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi faced 35 criminal court cases during his career. He was convicted once for tax fraud. Former French President Jacques Chirac and Nicolas Sarkozy, two former presidents of France, both have been convicted of crimes after leaving office. And in Israel, the former Prime Minister Ehud Olmeyer uh, spent a year in prison for bribery, fraud, and other charges. And the current Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is on trial for those same charges that put Omer behind bars. It's also worth noting how often Trump's closest advisors have faced criminal charges. To name a few, you start with his former campaign chief, Paul Manafort. 
his company's chief financial officer, Alan Weisselberg, his former uh, chief White House strategist, Steve Bannon, his longtime political strategist, Roger Stone, and of course, his former personal attorney and fixer, Michael Cohen, who also may be playing a starring role in the Manhattan DA's case. In fact, I spoke with Cohen's attorney, Lanny Davis, this afternoon about his client's role in this case and his safety. And we'll bring you that interview in a moment. But first, let's get more on what we know and don't know yet. Let's get right to our team of NBC News reporters that are on the ground with the very latest. Dasha Burns is outside Trump's Florida compound. Ali Vitale's on Capitol Hill. And Gabe Gutierrez is outside the Manhattan D DA's office. So, Gabe, I want to start with you. Um, is there any chance we see uh, this indictment before Monday morning? Uh, well, it's possible, Chuck, but at this point, we're expecting actually to see it uh, on Tuesday when the former president is arraigned here at the building behind me. And in, my, in your intro, you mentioned some of we, what we expect to see. The latest is we expect the former president to fly into LaGuardia on Monday uh, and then take a helicopter uh, from LaGuardia into Manhattan, spend the night at Trump Tower, surrender on Tuesday morning, and then make his court appearance at 2.15 p.m. Eastern Time on Tuesday, and that is when we expect to learn more about the charges in this case. As uh, we have reported, several sources say that there are around 30 counts uh, involving documents fraud, but again, we don't know exactly what they are. We expect mm -hmm. to learn more uh, there on Tuesday, Chuck. Gabe, what else have we, have we learned any more about how many folks were brought before the grand jury? Like, we have, an, we have sort of, we, we know certain people that appeared, but do we know everybody that appeared? Do we have a better accounting yet on that? At this point, uh, Chuck, it, much of this still remains in secret. You know, over the last several weeks, there has been great anticipation. You know, you, you've seen the witnesses that were brought here uh, towards the end, you know, Robert Costello. Uh, but, Chuck, you know, you have to, we, we had, I, we're getting all this indication uh, that, you know, there was no likely decision, no likely vote uh, uh, this week. And so when the vote happened yesterday, it took a lot of people here by surprise. And I think it really speaks to the secrecy of this grand, these grand uh, jury. Uh, proceedings. So still many questions remain about those 30 counts and what exactly they will be. You've spoken about them quite a bit, you yep. know, centers on this, um, you know, hush money payments to Stormy Daniels, but also sources now uh, confirmed to us that prosecutors did ask witnesses about Karen McDougal and, right. you know, what, um, you know, the, the, the alleged affair between the former Playboy model and former President Trump, which uh, he, of course, denies. But then, uh, a lot of this still in secret. Uh, and of course, the former owner of the National Enquirer, clearly is an important right, David part of this, David Pecker. Mm -hmm. Very quickly, do you see police presence? How visible is it, Dave? Well, certainly, Chuck, we have seen uh, a, a very heavy uh, police uh, presence uh, earlier today and actually th throughout the day. Uh, we've seen, um, you know, police here, um, security barricades uh, have been caught up, uh, or been, have been put up, and we have been told that the Secret Service is heavily considering uh, how this is all going to look uh, next week. This is, of course, unprecedented. Um, they will uh, be involved in transporting uh, the former president here. Um, the question will be, too, you know, whether the judge may impose any travel restrictions. Uh, we, legal experts think that that is unlikely, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it is already an operation that is un underway between the NYPD yeah. and the Secret Service. They are already looking mm -hmm. at this building to see how the logistical challenges of arraigning a former yeah. president of the United States, Chuck. Gabe Gutierrez on the ground for us in Manhattan. Gabe, thank you. Let me go down to Palm Beach. That's where we find Dasha Burns. So, Dasha, uh, it's interesting Last week, this felt like a, a Trump team that was ready, wanted, that almost was like asking for the indictment. This week, they're acting as if, oh, our bluff didn't work and this is actually happening. They seem to be a bit more uh, nervous about all this, don't they? Well, look, yeah, it went from a very sort of optimistic vibe where, you know, you had uh, the former president actually praising the grand jury and now uh, taken by surprise. Uh, Joe Attacapino telling Savannah Guthrie this morning that he, the former president was shocked when this uh, came down, as you talked about in the intro there. Look, we know that right now the former president is in Mar-a-Lago, presumably strategizing with his legal 
Bowl team also, Chuck, spending a whole lot of time, it seems, uh, on his social media platform, uh, mostly posting clips from Fox News, from Newsmax, where his allies are defending him and also attacking the Manhattan DA. And as you mentioned there, attacking the judge that is expected to oversee his arraignment next week. Um, and while his legal team is focusing on the case, make no mistake, Mr. Trump is also very much focusing on the campaign. You, you talked about the sort of optimism there. I think there is a sense that uh, they're still trying to push this moment as a potential uh, assist to the former president in his uh, 2024 campaign, especially when it comes to the primary. Chuck, look, we've seen multiple emails hit our inboxes over the last 24 hours uh, with, with fundraising, with, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to raise money off of this moment, trying to rally uh, support, rally voters. And as I've been talking to uh, some of his supporters, with, with some folks, it does seem to be working. There are people that are, have been drawn in by this event that are paying attention now to where maybe they weren't before, right? The question is, this could potentially, you know, help him in the primary. This is a very different audience, though, that he's going to have to right. play to when it comes to the general. So it's a, it's a bit of a risky gamble, um, you know, when you look at the, the months in between. But when it comes to right. the next six months or so, right. you know, when you look at primary season, this is going to suck up a whole lot of oxygen, Chuck. That's what is going to be fascinating is how his opponents try to navigate that aspect of things. Dasha Burns at Mar-a-Lago Forest uh, outside of the compound. Dasha, thank you. And Allie, uh, that brings me to you in Capitol Hill. Um, look, we all, I know it is not a surprise that Kevin McCarthy, uh, people like Jim Jordan, James Comer, people that have, have attached themselves before to Donald Trump are comfortable sort of rallying around him publicly. I'm curious, are you hearing from anybody who doesn't want to go on the record or on camera who's going, should we slow our roll here a little bit? I know Don Bacon seems to be about the only Republican. I mean, are House Republicans sure they want to attach themselves to him on this one? Yeah, look, Don Bacon is one of, I think, two or three lawmakers in the House Republican Conference who we've seen sort of, if not pump the brakes, then just say, look, let the courts work the way the courts are supposed to work, which is let's watch a grand jury play this out. Let's watch what the actual indictment says. But again, those voices are pretty few and far between. I mean, even look for the fact that we have not yet heard from Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, someone who has never minced words around the former president, but who also seems to clearly be waiting for something. Maybe it's just to be able to read the actual terms of the indictment. But most of the people who are in this building, typically, they're on recess now in perhaps the worst timed news ever in that these people are now flung to the wind and we can't get their reactions in real time. But most of them are blindly following the line that they laid out when the news of this possibility first broke last week, which is they are saying it's political, not engaging with the substance of it, and just saying that this is an example of another Trump witch hunt. Very few and far between and hard to find lawmakers on the Republican side who aren't saying that, Chuck. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene says she's going to organize a protest in New York. What's that going to look like? We have no details, but she had previously seemed to take more of a nuanced posture and now, of course, is headlong into saying she's going to New York to lead the protest. I don't know of anyone else who's going with her. Certainly, we've asked those questions, but we're going to be watching to see if there are other lawmakers who will not just you know, rhetorically go to his aid, but physically fly to his aid in New York as he goes for this indictment. I mean, that would be, I think, a whole nother escalation right. as we've watched them use their majority to try to bolster and counter and counterattack on this front right. against Bragg, now using saying that they're going to support him verbally. If someone were to come outside the courthouse, I mean, that's just yet another escalation here. I know it's one of those things. They're, they're calling for protesters. If protesters don't show, that's yeah. probably good for law enforcement. But does that say something about his political sway, right? There's a, there's a lot to read into here as we watch to see who does want to show up uh, for Donald Trump. Ale Vitale and Capitol Hill Force, thanks very much. Dasha Burns and Gabe Gutierrez also uh, with some great reporting. Thank you all for getting us started. And joining me now is somebody who may have some idea of what's in this indictment. It's Lanny Davis. He is the attorney for Michael Cohen, and he joins me now. 
You've been in this grand jury room representing Michael Cohen. He's testified. How many times has he spoken to these grand juries? So I've been in the room with the prosecutors mm -hmm. for uh, dozens of times. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this group of prosecutors in the last six months, but not in the grand jury room. I'm not allowed in New You're York State. You're not in the room. I'm in the adjoining. When Michael Cohen is in there. Correct. I'm in the adjoining room. Some states do allow attorneys in, but not in New York. So I'm in an adjoining room, and Lanny will come out on a recess or if he needs me. Yeah. And we'll talk, and I'm allowed to give him advice. Are you Are you able to get audio or no? No. Yeah, not at all. I tried. I was trying to. <laughs> <laughs> um. What is your sense? We don't know what's in the indictment yet. It has not been unsealed. Uh, there is speculation that it's 30 counts. Do we assume this is a couple of counts per check? What is your... Yeah, where where person, are you on this? I don't know. Okay. Uh, it's really the first time I ever heard a number. Mm -hmm. I'm not surprised that you would divide up a uh, president of the United States... It's been a source of frustration to me because we introduced this at the Cummings hearings on mm -hmm. television. Writes a check to reimburse a crime. Right and doesn't seem to be held accountable until now. So if they're using those checks as separate crimes, because mm -hmm. it is the reimbursement of a crime, you would think that would be a crime. And I say crime, uh, not to hurl names here, that's mm -hmm. what Michael Cohen pled to and served some of his prison time mm -hmm. for that crime. I would think that, that would, each of those would be a fraudulent uh, payment misdescribed as legal fees, which Mr. Trump, I believe, knew was reimbursements because his lawyer had mistakenly told the truth, Mr. Giuliani, and said they were reimbursements for the crime. And how many total checks were there? There were 11, 11. checks for $35,000 each. Mm -hmm. One check had two $35,000. The, the, uh, that was signed by his son and Mr. Weisselberg from the trust. Mm -hmm. They realized they shouldn't do that and the trust was not supposed to be used for that. So the rest of them were personally signed out of Donald Trump's, and you've seen them, mm -hmm. a personal bank account. Um, there has been uh, some reporting that the Karen McDougal, which was another woman that the uh, former president allegedly had an affair with, that also whose story was bought by the National Enquirer, that that is possibly a part of this indictment. What's your understanding of the interest by the prosecutor with the Karen McDougal situation. So my caveat, and I hope everyone believes me, is I can't reveal what I know from being in the room with the prosecutors. So whatever I tell you, mm -hmm. I know independently okay. uh, from my client yep. or from other sources, but yep. not what happened within the room with the prosecutors. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to talk about what happened in the room generally with mm -hmm. the prosecutors. But the answer to your question is that Karen McDougal constitutes a second crime involving illegally influencing an election through the use of hush money. Mm -hmm. That's the crime. Mm -hmm. It was a federal crime. I believe there are New York state laws that also make that a crime under New York State So you state don't know law. for sure whether this is part of the indictment or I whether this I was being used as pattern of practice? I do know that uh, it is an independent crime that Michael pled to. Mm -hmm. He pled to two crimes. One was the hush money paid at the direction of Donald Trump, according to the Southern District prosecutors, right. at, his, at their direction, at Trump's direction. The other was Karen McDougal. All mm -hmm. Michael did on that was to do the paperwork. That was a deal between... Uh, I can now say it's a public fact right. between David Pecker, the uh, mm -hmm. controller or leader of uh, National Enquirer Company, and Mr. Trump directly. And that deal was to buy her silence. And that was called a campaign finance crime, a crime of hush money to mm -hmm. influence an election. The reason I know that is that Michael Cohn pled guilty to that crime. Right. So the same uh, principle would apply if Cohn is guilty. And the Southern District just... To Let me actually, I, to, to help you out here, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put up a, uh, an excerpt from Michael Cohen's sentencing memo. Yes, please. I think please. it gets to what you're about to tell me. Please. Here's from page 13 of Cohen's sentencing memo. During the campaign, Cohen played a central role in two similar schemes to purchase the rights to stories. Two. Right. With respect to both payments, Cohen acted with the intent to influence the 2016 presidential C election. That's crime. in the sentencing memo. Yeah. And, and everybody should know that that added phase to influence an election mm -hmm. makes it a felony crime. Now, Joe Tacopino on the Today Show and with me last I Sunday, saw you've seen what he said. He said he would have made that payment regardless of whether there was an election. That's obviously what he wants a jury to believe. How do you prove either case? How do so you prove either I've, case? I've been hurting Joe Tacopino each time I say something nice about him. I know he probably would not want me to. But he's a good lawyer. I've worked with him as a colleague and in other ways. But he's uh, not unable to make that argument legally. If you do something personally that's illegal, mm -hmm. or you do something with a company, and I watched your interview of him, and mm -hmm. that's really dangerous. But it's not a defense to a crime to say that he did something from 
personal funds, or he would have done it anyway. It doesn't matter. The element of the crime is an intention to influence an election. The Southern District found that Michael Cohn intended to influence the election by just doing the paper. Remember, Michael Cohn paid nothing. It was the National Enquirer that paid her the money, $125,000 to buy her silence, $25,000 to buy the rights, uh, mm -hmm. other 150 total. And that was a crime, according to the Southern District, and it's a separate crime. Do you, is it your understanding that is David Pecker a, a witness now for the prosecution? So again, I can't tell you what I know based on what I know, but mm -hmm. I can tell you that he has been uh, given immunity. That's right. a public fact. He testified one time. That's a public fact. And then I read in the media that he appeared a second time after Mr. Costello. But let me set one thing straight if you give me this chance, which you are. And that is the Costello testimony had zero impact. Now, Costello, just to sort of uh, let viewers know, we're jumping around here. Costello was uh, a witness that the Trump uh, folks wanted to bring before the grand jury about two weeks ago. And he was supposedly going to refute things that Michael Cohen said. Anyway, go ahead. Well, I, I, I say nothing here disrespectful. Uh, it's up to Mr. Costello to explain why he thought it was so important. But I know from direct evidence that the grand jury, well, let me not mention the grand jury. I know that Michael uh, sat in a room for two hours waiting to be called in to rebut anything that Mr. Costello said that might have changed the status quo of the facts of the case. And all I care about are facts, not labels. And after Mr. Costello testified, we still don't really understand what he thinks was so significant about his testimony. Mm -hmm. uh, from what we understand, it was that Michael and he talked and he tried to be Michael's lawyer. And there's some emails chains that are quite embarrassing for him. He said that Giuliani is my friend. I can prove it to you. Here's a voicemail message. Mm -hmm. And he said that the president or, or Giuliani's, quote, client thinks very favorably of mm -hmm. you. So we don't know why that is helpful to Mr. Trump and why Mr. Costello thought it was. But I do know that David Pecker coming in yeah. uh, was not uh, related to anything that was to contradict Mr. Costello. And that's been said by many talking heads. and It's just not true. Uh, did Michael Cohen ha have to come back and rebut anything? Well, that's the thing that I interpreted. That. The answer is no. But we waited. We were there for you that. You were there to do a rebuttal and the fact that they did not bring him before the grand jury to rebut. I can actually say more than that now uh, that it's done. They came into our room, the group of prosecutors. We were ready. Michael jumped up, ready to go in. And they said, we don't need you. And I said, it's the inference that he said nothing that needs contradicting. And they said, yes. Um, Alan Weisselberg. There's, he's reportedly changed attorneys. Do you know if he has been brought in before the grand jury as a witness? No, I don't. And I and he could, meaning you don't know for sure that he has or you, or he has not. I, I have some suspicions that he's not changed his decision not to tell the truth. What I do know, and there's uh, certainly substantiation uh, for this, and let me just throw this in right now, Chuck. Everything that Michael Cohen has testified to is surrounded by documentation and corroboration, mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. And if he's a witness at this trial, he will be a principal witness, but his role is not to persuade anyone that he's telling the truth. Because any, you're saying anything he says will be backed up with documents. Everything is backed up by multiple sources. So whether you, if you have skepticism about him talking, That's why what you're saying is it doesn't matter that there's receipts. The two things I don't understand, I know Mr. Trump is famous for deflecting and changing the conversation and letting everybody repeat everything that he says. And mm -hmm. that's, that's, I suppose, his skill. But there's one thing they're getting wrong. Attacking Michael Cohen's credibility is missing the big picture. Mm -hmm. As in a famous movie, All the President's Men, what's the big picture? It wasn't the break-in. It was the whole gamut mm -hmm. of things. So right. the whole collection of documents, emails, text messages, mm -hmm. telephone calls, the context of what happened in early October with, uh, with Access Hollywood, all the way through after the Karen McDougal cover-up, um, hush money. So there's a full narrative here. Mm -hmm. Everything in that narrative is surrounded by corroboration, not just documents, but witnesses corroborating. And that's why your mention of Mr. Pecker, I would just suggest to your audience, ask yourself, if there's a separate crime that mm -hmm. Mr. Pecker was involved in, and I'm leaving yeah. that up to everybody to decide, right. if that's the case, 
then his testimony was with Mr. Trump. Michael right. Cohen was not involved in that crime. They did that between themselves. He papered it and did the work, but the actual activity was between Mr. Pecker and Mr. Trump. Do you think this should be the work of the DA or the work of the SDNY? So really, the SDNY uh, acted in very, very strange ways. They used individual one rather than Donald Trump, but they did say that individual one instructed Trump to do the time. Mm -hmm. But why did they use individual one? The memo in justice didn't require using individual one. It only says you can't uh, prosecute a sitting mm -hmm. president. Why did they bury the really significant revelations that he directed Michael? If Michael does a crime and the president of the United States mm -hmm. directs, it was buried on page 11 of this long memo. And then the big thing for me is if a president of the United States, a sitting president, sits mm -hmm. in the Oval Office, writes a check from his personal account that's deemed to be illegal, which it was deemed in the memo to be illegal. Sentencing memo, yes. This is an incumbent president. Wouldn't you want to lead with that in the first page? The answer to the mystery that Michael and I have been trying to figure out why, why, why did the Southern District act in this peculiar way? Read Jeffrey Berman's book, and it starts to tell you the answer. There was interference from yeah. Washington. The Attorney General in Jeffrey Berman, in case your audience forgets, was right. a U.S. attorney, right. gets a call from the Attorney General of the United States and tells him, reverse the Cohen guilty plea. What I said to Michael, why would they want to reverse your guilty plea? Because the, the horrible paper in that sentencing memo would now be expunged. Final question. Um, there's a lot of concern about safety with Alvin Brack. I, uh, I know from talking to Michael Cohen that his life's been threatened multiple times and he's been dealing with it a lot. Um, but more so recently, is the DA providing security for him and his family or not? So the one thing I have been told by Michael uh, and... Uh, I think it's important for anyone who's in a situation of worrying about security for family is not to talk about it. Right. So the answer is... Uh, is the DA trying to protect them? We, we, we have uh, indications that if needed, Michael will get protection, but mm -hmm. I won't say what's happening now. Or, right. But I can tell you, it's, um, it's, we're certainly aware of that danger when Mr. Trump tweeted what he did. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you're for Donald Trump or not. That's your political uh, mm -hmm. right. But you should be saying... Whoever I'm for should not be endangering somebody in this situation, as occurred on January 6th. And, and that is what happened when he tweeted that protest, protest, protest. You've been a lawyer a long time. You've seen a lot of things uh, uh, over the years. Is this an airtight case in your mind, or is this going to be a, a tough case? So it's not going to be an easy case, uh, because they do have to create a novel law. There is a state crime that I think is applicable, mm -hmm. and whether the judge says that we're right or not, not we meaning the prosecution, I shouldn't say we. But here's why I think it's a very, very solid case, maybe more solid than any of the other cases. Everyone's missing this. There's one question the jury has to ask and answer. The legal issue will be decided by a judge, but the factual question is very simple. Did Donald Trump have any political motivation when he directed Michael to pay $130,000 to mm -hmm. Stone? Any. If Not he, solely, but any. Any. Okay. Now, he has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, or at yeah. least the prosecution has to say beyond a reasonable doubt, that he had some political motivation. Right. His defense is going to be, nope, it was all about worrying about Melania. Okay. Now, I put to your audience and to any jury, you decide whether that's a believable excuse. Right. Certainly waiting to the very end of the election alone is an inference that there was a political concern. There's yeah. lots of testimony, right. lots of documentation about the political motivation. If the jury says, yes, he had some political motivation in making the payoff, if the law is there, that's the verdict. And there, the caveat at the end there, if the law is there. Lanny Davis, Correct. who represents Michael Cohen, thanks for coming in. Thanks Share for having me, Chuck. Good to see you. Thank you. Up next, crime and consequences. We've got more on Donald Trump's legal and political future as the former president faces one historic indictment. And if he gets another, more history. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. As we mentioned at the start of the show, despite all the reaction to the Trump indictment news, we still don't know what the charges actually are. Sources say we can expect about 30 charges, but what does that mean? The exact details won't be revealed until the indictment is unsealed. That is now likely to happen Tuesday. The DA could, on his own, unseal it right now if he wanted to. Uh, but we do expect it Tuesday, at least, the day that Trump will be arraigned. And, of course, this case is not the only one that faces the former president. So with us to dive deeper into all of this is NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett and Daniel Hor 
Witz, a former Manhattan assistant district attorney and now a defense attorney specializing in fraud cases. So, Laura, let's start with the Manhattan case here uh, as we go deeper. But I do want to ask you where, where you think things stand with the other, other two uh, investigations in Washington and Atlanta. But let's start with this one. Um, what's the... Uh, why, why would the prosecutor wait to unseal the indictment until after the arraignment? Is this just prosecutor discretion? Yeah, it's, it's totally in Alvin Bragg's hands. He could unseal it today if he wanted to, but sources have told us uh, that they're not going to do that. And it's totally regular for them to unseal it when Trump faces his arraignment um, on, on Tuesday, at least. That's when we expect that to happen. Uh, I think there had been some question about whether they would do it uh, sooner than that, uh, especially given the heightened public interest uh, and obviously the media attention around this case. We've been able to report about at least a rough number of counts. And so you can imagine if Bragg wants to be in the driver's seat, sort of dictating um, how all of this rolls out, you could see mm -hmm. them trying to get it out earlier, but no indication that it's coming out today. And we should expect it to come at least Tuesday, Chuck. Laura, how, you know, given that, I don't want to say there's been some misdirection by the DA's office with the, with the media, but, um, you know, who knows what it is. I, look, we all deal with sources. You think you've got it. You're not sure all this stuff. Um, how how much do you think we don't know here? I mean, we're, we've got questions about Alan Weisselberg, for instance. Do we think he appeared before the grand jury or not? That's something we just don't seem to know. The, we don't know because remember he could have yeah. yeah he could have gone in a, a different way, uh, considering that he's actually in custody right now. But we don't have any reporting mm -hmm. about that he was from the, in front of the grand jury. But it's supposed to be a secret process, and perhaps he went in on a day that we just didn't notice. We we should know, however, that he switched lawyers not too long ago, uh, which is notable. But as far as we understand it. His current lawyers are mm -hmm. still being paid by the Trump organization, so perhaps that doesn't inure to Alvin Bragg's benefit. And we know about David Pecker, any, but there hasn't been any, I mean, let me ask you this, anybody involved with the Karen McDougal side of this story, did they get brought before this grand jury or just David Pecker? Uh, as far as we understand it, we know that David Pecker was there mm -hmm. at least twice, um, and that New York Times has reported that Keith Davidson, who at one point represented um, Karen McDougal, appeared before the grand jury. Um, we don't, we didn't catch her on camera going in there. It doesn't mean to say that other people uh, who know about how that payment was structured. Um, but Pecker is probably the best possible witness on this, considering AMI, his previous employer and the place that he used mm -hmm. to work, is the one that actually paid the money to to Karen McDougal. Right. Let me uh, bring Daniel Horwitz into this conversation. Daniel, you've worked in this office. So help us here. Uh, if we do math, individual checks and the counts, should we start to assume that the, the number of counts and the number of checks maybe times two or three here? You got it, Chuck. That's exactly what they're doing. And, you know, this particular crime, um, falsifying business records, which I charged many times mm -hmm. when I was a prosecutor and a defendant as a defense lawyer. It's an art and not a science. So let me explain what I mean in terms of charging. You're absolutely right. Under the law, each individual false business record can be a separate count or a separate crime. So you got it right. Each check, each invoice, each entry in the general ledger. Add them up, and if it comes up to 30, that's what mm -hmm. you got. Now, when I say it's an art versus not a science, and maybe this is a little bit too much inside baseball, but my own view was if you, I've seen prosecutors charge 200 of these kinds of crimes um, where you've got many, many business records. And my view always was pick your top five and mm -hmm. charge those. But I can understand in this particular case right. why each individual false record, pardon me, the prosecutors would want to charge that as a separate crime. You don't want to leave anything to doubt. But I think you're spot on about what's going on here in terms of the number of counts. If this is indeed where they're going, this is something Cy Vance's could have done during his tenure. Why do you think it didn't happen? I, I think there are a variety of reasons. I mean, I think, first of all, during Cy's uh, tenure, the Southern District was already looking at this case, um, and Cy had begun his investigation into the overvalue, the, the, the valuation issues mm -hmm. um, with the former president's uh, assets. And so they were pretty down the road on that. Um, and, and I think they were committed to that. And, and obviously, they, not committed, they, 
They went very far down the road. They went to the Supreme Court in that case. So I think there are a variety of reasons that relate to resources, wanting to stay out of the Southern District's hair as they were doing right. the, the Cohen case. Um, and, and I think it's as simple as that. Um, and that as soon as I will say that, and I've said, said this before, I think that, you know, when Alvin took office, when D.A. Bragg took office, he and his team took a very careful, deliberative look on their own about what they thought about the strengths and weaknesses of an overvaluation case and clearly made a decision mm -hmm. that that's a case that needed more work and that there is this case and frankly th it was right for them to start digging into at that point and and also because remember yeah. um during most of size time uh donald trump was still the president right. so right. you know you've got the department of no, justice he only had about a one year he really only had a one-year window uh, there where, where Trump was was a private citizen. Let me ask you to Absolutely. react to something Lanny Davis said to me. I said, I said, you know, do you think this is an airtight case? And, and he didn't. Um, do you agree with him? And how and do you I mean, it, Alvin Bragg's first job is to convince a judge he, that a crime was committed here, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I, I, this is going to be a triable case, no matter what you think in terms of the, the politics. Um, you've got to prove that the president um, not only made these records or had people make the records, but that he knew these records were false and that he did it with the intention, as Lanny said, for a political motivation. But as Lanny also said, you've got, it would seem, you've got levels of evidence. You've got Cohen, you've got Pecker, You've got witnesses that the media have reported that include Hope Hicks, Kellyanne Conway. You've got records. And so mm -hmm. you've, you've got, you yeah. know, you've got what you need to get a conviction. So you think a judge will let this go to trial? You don't think this gets tossed? I, I don't think this is going to get tossed. I okay. think that they've got good arguments on the statute of limitations. I, I don't think that the fact that the theory is new and untested. I mean, I've said this before. You know, a long time ago, insider trading was only a civil case. And so when the SEC was founded in 1933, for about 40 or 50, maybe 60 years, 50 years, yeah. you've got insider trading handled civil case. Nobody goes to jail. Bob Morgenthau becomes the Southern District U.S. Attorney. And suddenly, out yeah. of the blue, insider trading is now a crime and as we all know every day in yeah. every federal prosecutor's jurisdiction across the country insider trading is a garden variety crime so yeah. i think the fact that it's untested let, yeah that doesn't that doesn't that doesn't trouble me fair enough laura let me ask you as best you can what the manhattan folks seem to telegraph at least within a wide range of a couple weeks how close they were do you get that same sense out of fulton county and look, the special counsel is an opaque process, so I understand that. But what, what's your sense of where we are timing-wise on, on Fulton County in particular, and then also Jack Smith? So on Fulton County, we understand it to be sometime this spring is our, our best sort of estimation. Of course, Fannie Willis had said it would be imminent. That has not come to pass, at least in the media's version of what eminent means. It may work in the prosecutor's version of what eminent means, but that one still seems like it has a little bit of work to go. As for the special counsel, that's a bit of a black box uh, when it comes to what Jack Smith uh, is working on and what the timeline is. But I shall, I shall point out, he's going after getting the testimony of the former vice president United States, which I, uh, by all accounts, have reported out, would be done at sort of the in game. That's mm -hmm. not your opening salvo to go after Pence's testimony. And if, in fact, Pence does not appeal that case and he actually testifies right. in front of that grand jury, you might be able to see this case wrap up sooner rather than later. Well, it supposedly it was all designed to try to get this done sooner. Rather, there was supposed to be an ex. ex it was supposed to be expedited, whatever that means, uh, we'll to see. the wheels of justice. Lord Jarrett. Our legal correspondent, Daniel Horwitz, the former Manhattan assistant district attorney. Thank you both for your expertise, reporting, and perspective. After the break, the politics and peril of indicting a former president. We're going to dig into how the criminal charges are going to impact 2024. The panel's next. We have a criminal justice system in this country. We have civil litigation. And former presidents are not immune from being accountable by either one. Welcome back. That was uh, Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell in 2021, after the second impeachment trial of Donald Trump, when he announced that he was going to vote uh, not to convict. But now that Trump has been indicted, some Republicans are suggesting the criminal justice system is 
now unable to do this job. Many Republican lawmakers and even 2024 primary rivals are jumping to the former president's defense. Joining me now is my panel for this Friday, Susan Page, Washington Bureau Chief of USA Today, Naveen Nayak, the Executive Director at the Center for American Progress, and Matt Gorman, Republican strategist and former communications director for the SEC. <laughs> Well, I'm not going to Susan first. <laughs> That's, hey, geez, I, uh, what did I do? All right, Lubesdorf, I'm blaming you for this interruption because, uh, all right, I've, I'm, I, I do want you to have the first word here because uh, I feel like I've seen everything in politics and you've seen more than I've seen. Look, we know we're in uncharted waters. How uncharted? Yeah. How choppy is this going to get? Totally. It's, uncharted waters does not adequately describe where we are now. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. And we don't know where we're going. Uh, you know, we don't know how strong the indictment will be. We don't know if he faces additional indictments on the other investigations. We do know what his stance is going to be. It's right. going to be defiant. Yeah. Uh, he's going to push back. And that's likely to help him with his base. And it's going to undercut him All in right. a general We're going to refill that water here. Let me, <laughs> let me give you a second. Matt Gorman, yeah. is this one of those moments this changes everything? Or does this change what? In the short term, he's going to raise a lot of money and that'll allow him to do more rallies. Um, but look, I think that what it's the same as it was in this respect. This will be a relatively holding pattern. I don't think anybody's not gonna run for president that wasn't playing on running before or vice versa. I think this will make you, over the summer, you lay the foundation, you go to the early states, you get the support you need on the ground level, mm -hmm. and then the debates, it, which I think it always was going to be. It's going to be Trump and DeSantis. Does yeah. somebody else have a moment? That is still the operating theory. Yeah. I mean, I, what does this do to debt limit? What does this do to Washington in 2023? What, what debt limit? What yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Here, I, here's who gets to decide. I think at some level this becomes irrelevant if he's not relevant politically. And I think the party continues to prop him up and make him relevant. Because as you pointed out at the start, other countries, other democracies mm -hmm. have indicted former presidents. It's actually a sign that your democracy is working because in a democracy, no one's supposed to be above the law. And if someone committed crimes, they should be held accountable. And that actually should be a good moment for this country because we've had a lot of moments where we've pushed the boundaries and nothing's happened, mm -hmm. not only in politics, but in other aspects. Mm -hmm. They keep propping him up. Yeah. If he was just a former president and irrelevant politically, it wouldn't matter. And I guess that's the question I have. I, I buy this at short term, Susan. Yep. This is going to help him. I just don't know what the weight of indictments, plural, mm -hmm. suddenly become yeah. on him. Is it accumulative? Yeah. And so that people are unwilling to accept that everybody in the legal system is out to get him for political reasons. Yeah. And we think if there are indictments in Georgia and from the special counsel, we think they will be... Uh, stronger cases about more serious crimes mm -hmm. than this one in, in, in New York. I, I'm not sure it shakes his core supporters. I think it makes it all but impossible for him to win a general election. I think it makes it hard for Republicans to challenge him in the primaries, and it makes it impossible for him to it, win a general election. It feels election. like a checkmate like this. Yeah. I don't know what Republicans do. Matt, what does a campaign against Donald Trump look like in this environment? I think a couple In the of, Republican primary. I think a couple things. I, I think... <laughs> A, I really do believe, whether it's Glenn Youngkin, Ted Cruz, Mike Pence, they all are, truly believe it's a travesty and it's some political kind of prosecution for one extent or another. So I think you go on a debate stage, you're not going to necessarily win a primary or really attack him on this, because I think they're all fairly agreed on how they view this. So it will leave space for other issues. And look, I think whether it was before this or after this, I've said repeatedly, you want it, there's no deus ex machina here. You want to defeat Trump in a primary, you do it at the ballot box. Um, and how does that shake out? We'll see. You know, but that is the, still the way here it was last week. It is this week. What's the trap for Biden on this? Because there's a part of me that thinks he should have been more outspoken today in this respect. It's a sad day for America. Hard stop. Doesn't matter what you think. But they're not going to engage at all, and I get that. But there's a whole bunch of people in the middle that are just nervous and exhausted. How does he talk to them without waiting in? I, I guess so. I mean... I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong here, but I, there's something here. There's an uns this is unsettling. We we know who this man was. Mm -hmm. You know, he he led a, an insurrection. That was the saddest day when he was still sitting in the White House. So I actually do think until we cut him loose, and you know, the country has now rejected him. He's lost the popular vote twice. Clearly, the American people don't want him to be president. I think it is incumbent on the Republican Party to decide that they want to. And I, this is this is my hope. I'm not you know, this is I don't know the Republican yeah. Party, but. Someone has to actually take him on for his crimes. I, I think, you know, we had that moment 
January 7th, January 8th, mm -hmm. where it looked like people were like, whoa, you crossed the line. You shouldn't attack a country and foment an insurrection. Mm -hmm. They all came back. And I worry where, you know, he's going to be indicted multiple times. And instead of actually following, upholding the rule of law, they're all quietly attacking, not quietly, attacking Democrats. My theory in this, Susan, is I would be, if I were in the DeSantis shoes, who, by the way, needs a timeout badly, mm -hmm. take advantage of it. And like, you know what? Let him shadow box with these prosecutors all on his own. Go crazy. I'm not getting in this race till the fall. Well, if it gets if it gets so that um, uh, Trump just seems totally beleaguered and unacceptable and right, just, let him fight himself that's good out, for punch DeSantis, himself but out. Yeah. That's kind of not the history of how Trump comes across, even when he's in his most beleaguered state. And as for Biden, it seems to me he's smart not to talk about this. Why doesn't he talk about the things that actually people actually worry about, like going to Mississippi and talking mm -hmm. to people who've had tornado damage or dealing with some of the issues? I think it's smart for him to look like right. he's governing about the issues that really mm -hmm. matter to Americans, not engaging on this sideshow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Matt, I just, I go, is, why doesn't the argument work with, with Republican voters that's this? We love, we love what you did for the party. We love how you've changed the course of the Republican Party. But at the end of the day, uh, he can't win. And if, they, if he can't win, what's the point? How come that messaging doesn't seem to work with his supporters? Why do you think it hasn't worked yet? I think it's it's March, March 31st. You think of the, it could of the off year. Look, I think you're going to hear some form of that among quite a few people on a possible debate stage, right? And I think you don't... Electability, I don't think, is the right word, because I think it's been... Democrats <laughs> clearly cared about electability <laughs> in 2020, <laughs> right? They decided... No, I'm, I'm, saying, I agree. I'm I saying the term. Do. Yeah. I'm saying the term. I think what you, what you say is winning in terms of winning the electorate, Winning over voters, uh, mm -hmm. but also winning over Congress. Like you mm -hmm. want, you want to be able to do something, right? So you make winning broader than just 270 electoral votes. How do you, you know, make it cultural? How do you make it legislative impact? And that, that's what, that's what you look at. Successful governors, you're, up, you're able to do that. Bush and others, when they mm -hmm. were able to talk about that. Go ahead, Demet. I was going to say, I, I, I feel like we're this is deja vu all over again. <laughs> Everyone thought Trump would hang himself. Everyone thought Trump would, and we're seeing it again. And if the Republican Party wants to be relevant, they're a minority party, they continue to struggle, they haven't gotten 50% of the vote in a national election, in presidential election for four elections now, they have got to be serious about taking on the man who's hijacked their party. And no one seems, I mean, Asa Hutchins put out a statement yesterday, <laughs> but like... He's about the only one that yes. seems to not have taken a taken a posture here on, on the indictment. It, Susan, I was thinking about something. When watching Kevin McCarthy not just say he supports the president, but they're going to, that the House Republicans were going to use their majority to get to, to sort of investigate Bragg, the first thing I actually thought of was, so how does this fit the debt ceiling debate uh -huh. the conversation? How does this impact negotiation? This is going to be happening. Well, the atmospherics are over here. I, and Republicans, some of the best known on the House Republicans, are more focused on defending Trump I don't think they have the stomach for the debt ceiling fight that, that, that others may have. I just feel like the House Republicans are, they're not in a very strong place here right now for those things. Does, has Trump just sort of knocked that, basically knocked that out? There's only one issue in the Republican Party, and that's Trump. Yeah. And are you for him or against him? And almost all the Republicans who speak out are with him. Yeah. No, I do, I do think that is one thing that maybe a showdown that, or a dog that doesn't bark. Anyway, Susan Naveen and Matt, thank you. After the break, President Biden is now answering a question about, uh, isn't answering any questions about Trump's indictment as he spent the day in storm-ravaged Mississippi. We'll show you some highlights next. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back. As we noted, before departing the White House today, President Biden was asked by reporters multiple times to weigh in on the indictment of former President Trump, who is also Biden's potential 2024 opponent. Each time the president gave reporters the same answer. And he's not commenting on the matter. President Biden and the First Lady then traveled to Mississippi, visiting some areas impacted by that deadly tornado that ripped through the state last week. As more storms threatened the Midwest and south uh, of this country this weekend, the president met with local officials and the Mississippi governor, Republican Tate Reeves, as he toured neighborhoods that were simply flattened by the extreme weather. It's a very poor community that was hit, folks. Roughly 300 homes and businesses were destroyed in the towns hit hardest, and hundreds more uh, of structures suffered damage. The confirmed death toll has climbed to 21 in the state. One person also died in the state of Alabama. The president reaffirmed his support for the recovery efforts and pledged federal funding in his speech today. Take a listen. Today, I authorized the federal government to cover 100% of the cost 
for removing debris and emergency measures that are involved in keeping up here by keeping shelters up and running and paying for every overtime for everyone. 100 percent of the cost, not for the state, but for us for 30 days. And then after that, we're not leaving either. NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli joins me now. And, and Mike, uh, seems like he and Governor Reeves, Republican, you know, that there was no, didn't look like there was much uh, politics that I say that in a good way. No, that's right, Chuck. This is the first time President Biden has gone to Mississippi as president, a state he lost by more than 15 points. White House advisors often like to point out that he promised to be a president for all Americans and he was going to, uh, whether it through his policy or the response of his administration uh, to a crisis like this, govern for all Americans. And this, so this was a good illustration of that. Governor Reeves was very praising of the president, welcoming of him uh, and the assistance that the federal government is providing. And President Biden returned that. It's a scene we've seen play out even with the likes of Ron DeSantis, mm -hmm. where President Biden traveled to Florida this summer, uh, they both again praised the quick response of the federal and state government, the cooperation between the two. And Chuck, what we're not hearing, of course, from the president today is anything about the former mm -hmm. president. Really, it's useful here to have the experience having covered Biden in the 2020 campaign. Trump is basically baked in the cake. This is how the White House tends to view these things. It's, it's notable the president's in the midst mm -hmm. of this, you know, 20 state invest in America tour, trying to tout the benefits of the chips manufacturing right. bill, all coming at a time when they believe the number one issue is going to yeah. be the economy. In 2020, Biden would make big speeches in historic places like Warm Springs, Georgia, or right. Gettysburg, Pennsylvania at key moments. But otherwise, it was an economic message, and that's kind of what we're seeing right now against the backdrop of an indictment of the former president. You and I have been given some strong hints that he's on the Obama timeline for announcing his reelection. That would be first week in May. Any reason that, to think that that slides, given the current atmospherics, shall we say? There's a lot of reason to believe it might slide, and it has everything to do with the fact that President Biden knows there's no real primary challenge. There's no real reason to announce earlier rather than whenever he feels the moment is finally right. I will say there is, I believe, in the administration efforts to speed that up, to get onto the right timeline. Yeah. Uh, but he knows there's really no reason to get in as early as it I, seems it might be. Like I said, and with the atmospherics, if you told me everybody decided on a fall plan, uh, like we did, oh, some 20 years ago. Wouldn't surprise me at all. Mike Memoli, uh, reporting from the White House for us. Mike, thank you. Before we go, I want to share with you uh, what the U.S. Army just released, the identities of the nine soldiers that tragically were killed in that helicopter training accident during uh, at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, Wednesday night. I just want to take a moment to, to, to show you uh, who they were um, and how old they were and in some cases where they were from. Jeffrey Barnes, age 33. Corporal Emily Marie E. Bolanos, age 23. Chief Warrant Officer Zachary Esperaza, 36. Sergeant Isaac John Gallo, 27. Staff Sergeant Joshua Gore, 25. Warrant Officer Aaron Healy, 32. Staff Sergeant Taylor Mitchell, 30. Chief Warrant Officer Rustin Smith, 32. And Sergeant David Salinas, Jr., age 23. They came from all over America, folks. Milton, Florida, Jackson, Missouri, you name it, it was all over America. In a statement, the Army writes, the whole division and this community stand behind the families and friends of our fallen soldiers. The investigation into that accident is still currently underway. That does it for this hour. We'll be back Monday with more Meet the Press Now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.